So uh, I'm going to talk about the paper that uh, John wrote uh, about Peter Strasser's article, uh, which was forthcoming in uh, some volume collected papers. Um, yeah, so I, I actually wrote this uh, little paper or draft, really it's obviously only a draft yet, during this summer school. And originally I just wanted to point out that, um, well, John thought that the fact that Strawson includes he could not do otherwise in his list of excuses is problematic because Strawson says that, well, no excuse generalizes in such a way that uh, it would apply to everyone under determinism, but he couldn't do otherwise, seems to possibly generalize to everyone so that no one could otherwise under determinism. And originally I just wanted to argue that John was wrong about that, and then it sort of grew a bit, so I also wanted to argue that there is no reason to accept an error theory about people's invocation of the principle of alternative possibilities uh, in everyday conversations about blame. And also, <laughs> furthermore, that uh, there might not be this uh, big important distinction between leeway compatibilism and source compatibilism that many people think. Uh, so you see that it's sort of grow out of this little objection to John's paper into something bigger possibly. So this is very much a, a work in progress. Um, but anyway, uh, Strawson's excuses, as you might recall, I'm going to write now up here. Strawson has two kinds of excuses. So it's one group of excuses that point out that uh, the agent wasn't uh, rational or reason responsive or yeah, what you want to call it. Like there's something wrong with the agent temporarily or permanently that makes it a case that he can't be morally responsible. And the other group points out that the action, there was nothing wrong with the agent, but the action was compatible with a good will on part of the agent. The action might have been harmful or injured someone, but when we look at the circumstances, we see that the action was actually compatible with a good will. And now, could not have done otherwise. It's supposed to belong to this group, according to Strawson. Um, so, what I first want to argue then that because Strawson places could not have done otherwise in that group, it is obvious that uh, he has to be talking about the ability to do otherwise or alternative possibilities in some kind of compatibilist sense. Because otherwise it just makes no sense to put that excuse in that group. Because as Strawson himself points out, if the world is deterministic, it does not follow that everyone uh, has a good will all the time. Uh, so it, it doesn't follow from the truth of determinism that you could universally excuse people by saying that everyone has a good will. Clearly, I mean, a person can have an ill will even if determinism is true. So the could not have done otherwise must mean something which is compatible with determinism. The alternatives have to be compatibilist alternatives. And uh, Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to tear off this one rather than writing on that one because of how the camera is positioned. Yeah, but keep that. Uh, I mean, keep it somewhere. Yeah, uh, okay, so, okay. But now I already torn this one. Okay, yeah, I, I'll, I'll tear it completely and just leave it here. Uh, okay, so I came up with this little example and I'm going to use several varieties of this several times. Uh, it's a realistic example because I think that uh, in line with Strawson, I want to discuss how people actually use excuses and for that we need realistic examples, I think, or at least it's an advantage if the examples are realistic. Uh, so the example goes like this. Okay, here is 
John's house, let's say. It's John who lives here. Here is John standing in his yard. Here are John's flower beds. They're very big flowers, obviously. And uh, he's like very proud of his flowers. And here's a road. Because Tina takes good care of me. Yeah, okay. And here is a, this is a brick wall, a high brick wall. And here is me. So I'm riding my horse here. Okay, you, you see this beautiful picture? This is me riding my horse along this road. Here's John, here are his flower beds. Okay. Suppose now that my horse unexpectedly panics. Maybe some kids threw firecrackers at him or something. So my horse unexpectedly panics and rushes along. I can't stop him. Uh, suddenly I see that there's a car here. Um, car. Okay. Uh, there's a car here that someone has carelessly parked across the road. Uh, so I can't stop my horse because of his panic, but I can with great difficulty steer him to the left by leaning heavily to the left. Uh, so I lean to the left here and steer my horse like this over John's flower beds so that the horse tramples them. And here I was out of compatibilist options. I'm going to go into detail of what a compatibilist option might be later on, but let's just say here intuitively I'm out of options even in a compatibilist sense. Mm. And here it clearly makes sense for John to excuse me and say that, oh, it was a pity about the flowers, but you could not have done otherwise. This seems like a very natural thing to say. Uh, I mean, if we take away the panic of the horse and the car and everything, and uh, assume that uh, I'm just riding along here in full control of my horse, there's no obstacle here, but I just gleefully turn my horse to the left and go like, ha ha ha, look at your pretty flowers now, then I mean clearly I'm displaying an ill will here and ought to be blamed according to the Strawson theory, uh, where it makes perfect sense to blame me. And even if it, if it turns out that determinism is true, then yeah, an incompatibilist will say that I don't deserve blame and might even cite my lack of alternatives as an explanation. But if we accept, as Strawson does, that the important thing is my will here and what kind of will I expressed, then I mean, Clearly, the truth of determinism doesn't mean that I did not express an ill will when in this scenario I just turned my horse and by ha ha ha, I'm letting him trample your flowers. <laughs> and that I think requires a bit of a caveat because you might believe like Ishtiaki Haji does for instance, that determinism rules out a lot of morality and if you take an ill will to be a moral concept, then possibly it might be ruled out. But I take it that an ill will in, in Strawson's terms is a psychological concept but with moral importance. Mm -hmm. And if you take that as a psychological concept, then yeah, clearly I display an ill will even if determinism is true. Uh, in the I'm sorry, do you mind being interrupted? Uh, uh, no, you can okay. interrupt a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, I was just wondering, let's, let's say everything is in the first version of your case where there's a car there, someone spooks the horse, and I realize I have to turn, but secretly I've always hated the flowers. Yeah, that and, is coming. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. It's coming, it's coming right now. So, um, okay, I, I'm just gonna, uh, be, before I get to that example though, I'm just gonna uh, make room for a possible objection. One might object that in a compatible sense, as long as you're still acting, you always have some kind of options. So let us say that, yeah, I do have the option of doing nothing, in which case my horse, instead of being turned like this, would rush headlong and then self-preservation instinct would make the horse dart to the left in the very last minute. So I have the options of going like this or going like this, but these are just flickers. They are clearly not robust options. But let us take that case that John started on here now. Uh, okay, suppose that my horse panics as before, there is a car in my way, etc. But I've always hated John and his stupid flowers. So although I have to turn the horse, I like laugh in glee when I do this and go like, ha 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 ha. Okay. Um, yeah, well, 
Th this is a bit tricky, but I don't think, and I think people's intuitions may legitimately <coughs> differ here, but I don't think that Strawson's account as I interpret it and extrapolate it now gives rise to anything that is really counterintuitive. Uh, counter uh, because, uh, I mean, Strawson would have to say that since my riding over your flowers is compatible with a goodwill, because that's what they say, not actually expressing a goodwill, but it's compatible with one, I'm not blameworthy for riding down your flowers. But uh, one might argue here, I think, uh, very plausibly, that riding down your flowers gleefully and riding them down regretfully are actually two robust alternatives because they have different moral importance. Normally people would react to them very differently and so on. Uh, so I can still be blameworthy for writing them down gleefully rather than regretfully. So like intuitively, it's very different whether I go like, ha ha ha, whether I, I'm sorry John, while I'm writing that. So, so yeah, you can still say that I'm blameworthy for writing them down gleefully. And I will get to proper Frankfurt examples later on after some more uh, horse examples here. Because the, you might still say that, okay, this is fine as far as it goes, but it seems like Frankfurt examples still pose a problem for the idea that there is some kind of connection between having alternative possibilities, even in a compatibilist sense, and um, expressing and your action being compatible with a good will. Uh, but uh, I think that it, when we do invoke the principle of alternative possibilities when excusing or blaming people, uh, it is implicit that the agent had true beliefs about his alternatives or his lack of alternatives. We leave this implicit because people normally have true beliefs about their alternatives. I'm, I'm still assuming that alternatives are compatibilist. Um, therefore we leave it implicit, but the fact that we do leave this implicit, that it's actually part of the invocation of alternative possibilities, um, can be shown by coming up with cases that are still realistic but where belief and reality comes apart. In those cases it is just so natural to explicitly cite the agent's belief when either blaming or excusing from blame that we can assume that the assumption that the agent had true beliefs is there implicitly in cases where we do not actually mention the belief but just say something about oh you had no other option. Um, so, suppose that we tweak the example again. So I'm riding here in full control of my horse. Uh, I have carelessly left my glasses at home and I, am, uh, I have a fairly bad eyesight. And we can imagine there are like some bushes hanging over this car as well. So yeah, I see that John's house is here. I know that his beautiful flowers are here. I, I don't really see this cause. I believe that I can keep on riding straight ahead through these bush bushes. And uh, furthermore, there is like another car coming up behind me here. Uh, I don't hear that car because I also listen to music at my iPhone, so I'm like a very negligent uh, horse rider in this example. So yeah, um, this car is like, um, yeah, he doesn't like uh, people doing horse riding on the regular roads, he's like pressing on ahead. So actually, uh, I'm soon, my horse is soon gonna be forced to turn like this. But I don't know that, I think that I can just ride straight ahead if I want to. Uh, because I dislike John so much, uh, I willfully turn my horse like this and has the horse trampling down his flowers. And John seeing all this, he's probably ready to excuse me at first because he saw the cars and all that. So he thought that I turned just because I was forced to turn. But then he hear me shouting something that indicates that I actually thought I could ride on straight ahead. Maybe I shout like, you know what? I thought I was just going straight ahead into town, but then I saw your flowers and thought that they will look so much better if they're flat or something like that. Okay, at this point, it seems pretty natural for John to say like, what, like you thought you could ride on ahead, but you just rode over my flowers willfully? That's horrible. Um, and actually indicate my belief as relevant 
for the fact that I'm blameworthy. And uh, the opposite, of course, uh, would be a situation where I believe that I have no other options, but I actually do. So let's imagine that this isn't a car. It's like some kind of cardboard thing that looks like a car. For some reason, it has, it has been left across the road. My horse panics. I believe that there is a car here. I believe that I have to turn my horse to the left uh, in order to avoid the last minute sudden dart, uh, which is going to trample down the flowers anyway. So I believe that I have to turn my horse to the left, but actually I could have ridden on straight ahead through this like cardboard thing here. And so I turn my horse over the flower beds and uh, when John realizes that I honestly believe that I had no other option, it makes sense to say that like, oh, you really believed you couldn't do otherwise, so okay, and cite my belief once again this time in an excuse. So we do not really need, I think, an error theory for the invocation of a principle of alternative possibilities. All we need to assume is that normally the, the fact that the agent's beliefs are supposed to be correct regarding his having or not having alternative possibilities is just left implicit. There is a, it's only when beliefs are false that we explicitly mention beliefs. And this brings us finally to the Frankfurt case. So uh, in, a, in a standard Frankfurt case, Jones believes that he can either murder or not murder Smith. Uh, so it makes sense to blame him and say that, well, for all you know, you could have abstained from murder. You just willfully on purpose went along and murdered him anyway. Um, obviously, now, um, on this account, we have to accept and on this account, which I take to be an extrapolation from Strawson's use of uh, the principle of alternative possibilities and claiming that it is um, uh, compatible with determinism. And then uh, I sort of build on that and uh, develop it a little bit further. Uh, but uh, on this account then, uh, we have to say that if Jones knew about Black and the device in his head, he couldn't be blameworthy <coughs> for murdering Smith. If he wants to see Smith dead and thinks that murder is okay, he can be blameworthy for having a bad character and stuff like that, but not for the murder in itself. Once again, I suspect that people's intuitions differ on this point, but my intuitions are like perfectly fine with this. I think that everyone has to accept that it's at least not a really weird counterintuitive conclusion that Jones is not uh, blameworthy for the very murder in an informed case where he knows about Black and the device. So, uh, this, uh, so using PIP in this way doesn't really need to any counterintuitive implications regarding Frankfurt cases or anything like that. Um, yeah, okay, I have some, some more time. Okay, so one might, since I am now claiming that it's actually the belief in alternative possibilities that does the job rather than the alternative possibilities themselves that are necessary for moral responsibility, one might uh, ask, why it, seem, why it seemed important to me to argue that Strawson's alternatives must be compatibilist alternatives, because obviously a belief in alternative possibilities is compatible with determinism, regardless of whether the alternatives that we believe in are incompatibilist or not. I, I mean, all kinds of beliefs can exist in a deterministic universe, right? Uh, but, I mean, it is still an important point to make that these alternatives are compatibilist because although it seems unproblematic that in certain cases people have false beliefs and their moral responsibility depends on them having a false belief, it would still be a problem if the existence of moral responsibility at all depended on us not knowing that the world is deterministic and the moment we find out that it is, then moral responsibility evaporates, that would still seem to be like really strange. So therefore it was still an important point to make that if having or not having alternatives is supposed to be connected to what kind of will you express in your action, then the alternatives must be compatibilist. And then I think uh, 
There is one more reason which is much weaker than the first but sort of points in the same direction for assuming that the alternatives that Strawson talk about are compatibilist alternatives. Uh, so this is admittedly much weaker but I still think it points in the compatibilist direction. And it is this. Uh, Strawson repeats over and over again that uh, the objective attitude is not the attitude from which we make moral responsibility judgments but presumably someone who muses over the consequence argument or so on have some kind of objective attitude in that moment taking up a metaphysical perspective on human beings rather than this like engaged uh, interaction perspective uh, so it seems more plausible that from this perspective of interaction and relationship and so on what kind of alternatives you would be interested in would be the same kind of alternative options that we are interested in when we deliberate and this sort of repeats John's point from uh, this text we read from my way when he says that I take it that it's the same uh, freedom conditions that are relevant for forward-looking agency and deliberation and backward-looking agency and moral responsibility. I, I think for Strawson that would be a very plausible claim to make as well. So then what kind of alternatives are relevant for deliberation? Well I'm sort of running out of time here but I mean there is the two-door argument for, from Van Inwagen. Uh, reason to believe that it's not just some kind of epistemic openness but there are suggestions on compatibilist can like you need to believe that you can do A and B in a compatibilist sense in order to deliberate about whether to do A and B for instance like Hilary Bock has the suggestion that in order to deliberate about whether to do A or B you need to believe that nothing in, in nothing that is independent of your deliberation makes A impossible and nothing independent of your deliberation makes B impossible. The past and the laws of nature are normally not independent of your deliberation because they will run through it. Um, something like that maybe. Now you're obviously not only morally responsible for actions where you actually deliberated before so we should switch to our deliberation for something else, maybe John's reason responsive mechanism. So let's say that in order to deliberate about whether to, or oh sorry, in order to be morally responsible for doing A, it has to be the case that whether you did A or B depended on your reason responsive mechanism, something like that. Or rather that you believed at the time that whether you were going to do A or B depended on your reason responsive mechanism. But at this point it seems like there is not that kind of great divide between actual sequence compatibilism where you say that oh whether you're morally responsible or not depends on like whether you expressed an ill will or um, whether you were reason responsive and some kind of leeway compatibilism that we might have thought because I have argued that um, even if you accept that alternatives are important it is plausible that what really does the job is a belief in alternatives rather than the alternatives themselves and this belief in alternatives is necessary for responding to reasons rather than just doing what you have to do regardless of what you want and for expressing an ill or good will so I kind of think that maybe the only interesting distinction you could make here is what comes first like uh, what is what is what has the primary importance is it the case that we, th we respond to reasons and express our wills in different ways because we have alternatives or is it like the other way around but yeah okay so that wasn't a very good ending but this is very much a, a draft still and that was my presentation yeah uh, so you s in the beginning you said that you are going to criticize John's argument yeah. yeah but uh, and uh, then you agree with uh, the outcome of John's argument that Strawson fails to avoid metaphysics is it true? So you, you, you yeah, I, I guess, I guess I made an an agreement there in the end because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think Strawson really does manage as long as you accept the 
his list of excuses and why the excuses work, as long as you accept that, and that is obviously controversial, he does manage to avoid any problems with incompatibilism. And his use of his invocation of the principle of alternative possibilities isn't problematic um, for his compatibilism. But, but some kind of control condition, yeah, seems to be here. So, so far, I, I agree with John. So, um, uh, yeah. So, um, so, so, so I take it that the, the main point being just just to make sure I, I didn't miss this key point. Um, if if you believe that you couldn't have done otherwise. Um, and right. maybe it's enough that you should have believed given your evidence and you can sort of extrapolate it in different ways, but yeah. And in those cases, that excuses moral responsibility. So I'm, I'm curious about some of these um, epistemic conditions because that does seem like very uh, like a very plausible line where if, if you really thought that you couldn't have done otherwise, you're not showing, if ill will is what it takes to, to, to merit blame or to merit um, responsibility, it seems like if you're really not showing ill will because you really genuinely thought you couldn't have done otherwise, um, then that's at least intuitively plausible that you wouldn't be morally responsible or blameworthy. I'm curious, even in cases, so I mean, if you had an agent, so I guess there's, there's, two, there's two, two questions I guess I have. So even if you had an agent who's very deluded in terms of what he thinks he can and cannot do, um, even in these compatibilist sense, if he, if he really thinks well, if there's no one standing, like if, if he really, if he really thinks, well, if the door is a red, is painted red, then I can't open it. So I really, you know, like, like so that you, you could have some situation where, you know, he needs to open the door to help someone else, but he, he won't open it because he thinks he can't. Maybe that's not really showing ill will, something like that. So, so, and then I mean, so that's so I'm I'm curious. Maybe you have cases like that, but then maybe you also have some sort of. Um, some sort of tracing condition where, where you, you, you have some sort of obligation to know what you can or can't do yeah, or something like that. I don't really go into this. I just have a parenthesis where I say maybe you need to qualify this epistemic condition a bit more. Maybe you can be blameworthy if you ought to have realized that you had alternative possibilities or, or something like that. So I'm sort of open to that and doesn't really take a stand on it because I think there are lots of things that can be said about that and probably like lots of situations where it's, it's complicated. Um. Yeah, so, so I don't really have a good answer. Well, no, no, I mean that's 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 interesting. I mean, it, it yeah, I mean, it, but it certainly seems um, at least at least intuitively plausible that that that, that would ex if if we're going for avoidance of ill or if we're looking for manifestations of ill will, the beliefs don't even necessarily have to be true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the beliefs definitely don't have to be true because in the horse examples, they had two cases where the beliefs weren't true. But right. they were still supposed to be like reasonable. Well, reasonable beliefs. given your evidence. Yeah, so they evidence. weren't like deluded or psychotic agents. Uh, I think, uh, but probably I think if you, if you make thought experiments where agents uh, have some kind of psychosis or are really deluded, I think you might get different results from case to case depending mm -hmm. on little details, uh, I guess. But and, and it seems like if you, if you can capture the normal cases, I mean, so, so even, in, even in cases where people already have delusions, there, there's, there's other sets of considerations that might mitigate their moral responsibility anyway. So if you can get the normal cases right, that seems to be a good place to focus on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Simon. Um, just to clarify, are you, are you saying that someone is not someone is not going to have the ability to do those unless they believe, like the only if a necessary condition? Or are you saying that it's sufficient oh. to believe? Uh, no. Okay. G good point. I, I need to to clarify that. Um, uh, just wait a second. I, yeah, I, I could have been clearer on that, but I meant to make a distinction which makes it possible to actually have alternative possibilities, uh, although you believe that you don't have, as well as believing that you have alternative possibilities, although you don't. Uh, so, uh, so, I mean, the idea was that in this case, where there's actually only a cardboard thing in front of me rather than a car, in that case, but I believe it's a car, in that case, I do have two alternative possibilities in the sense that 
um, what I do next sort of depends on my, my uh, appreciation of reasons. So if I had counterfactually believed that uh, yeah, it is just cardboard, I can write straight ahead and I should do that to save John Flowers, then I, I would have done that. Um, or, or I mean something along these lines. Uh, but uh, if I believe that I have to turn to the left, I turn to the left. So in this situation I do have alternative possibilities in a sense because of what I do most proxy, uh, so what I do depends on what happens up here. But I believe that there is a real car in front of me so that I can't do otherwise but to turn left. So I wanted to make that distinction, but maybe maybe it doesn't maybe there is some problem with this. Um, yeah. Maybe there is some sense in which I can't have compatibilist options unless I believe that I have. I, I'm not sure. I'm so I was just confused about what the compatibilist option was. Yeah, it was that what I do depend on my reason responsive mechanism. Obviously, there will be more distant causes, but that is the most proximate cause. So whether I do A or B will most proximally, is that an English word, proximally? Yeah, will most proximally depend on what happens in my reason responsive mechanism. Now what happens there may be entailed by facts about the past and the laws of nature and so on, but most proximally, whether I do A or B depends on what happens in my reason responsive mechanism, then I have compatibilist options. My idea was that you could have options in this sense and that this was the case in the cardboard prop car version of the horse example, uh, even though you falsely believe that you don't have options in this sense, but maybe there is something problematic. Yeah. So, do, where, so where does the options come in? Right? W like what happens depends on your reasons responsive mechanism, but what your reasons responsive mechanism does depends on the wider environment. Right, so yeah. if you just hold fixed the reasons response and mechanism, then you can have different options. But isn't that, then I would just, I'm struggling to see what the difference is between that and John's view. Yeah, I think, I don't know if it is very different from John's view, except insofar as I say that uh, given the, the most obvious interpretation of uh, Strawson's talk about alternatives, they are compatibilist alternatives, so his invocation of PAP is not a problem for his compatibilism. That is obviously something where I argue against John. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, this sort of elaboration of Strawson that takes into account uh, alternatives becomes very similar to John's view. Uh, and that was something I sort of discovered very recently since I just wrote this <laughs> during the summer school. And I thought that was interesting too because on the face of it, there is like this leeway incompatible, sorry, leeway compatibilism that invokes PIP but has some kind of compatibilist interpretation of the alternatives. And then there is source compatibilism like John's view and that is a, some really different alternative. Like I do think alternatives are important or you think only ill will or reason responsiveness is important. But I thought, think I have discovered that there is this important connection between at least believing for good reasons that you have alternative options and being able to act for reasons rather than just doing what you're pushed into doing and uh, expressing your will through your actions. So maybe you can't make that sharp distinction between leeway and source when it comes to compatibilism. So, so you were pushing the line that we discussed when we discussed John's view about whether John's view is just a notational variant of yeah. or whether they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is sort of what I ended up doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm, it's an important question, of course. Uh, I sometimes think, I don't want my view to be just a notational variant of classical. <laughs> I mean, will that be what I, what's on my tombstone or whatever? Will that the final judgment? <laughs> the, John Fisher's view was just a notational variant of God. But maybe it's okay. I, I don't know. I'd say. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sort of hurting you here with this presentation. But oh, could I just add, uh, could you uh, display once more the original sheet that you had? Just, uh, I mean, you could just hold it up yeah. for a second because I thought there was at least one point where I might disagree. But, um, so you say the second kinds of excuses, uh, Strassen says the action was compatible with a goodwill. And remember we looked at it, it's a little, I don't have it in front of me, it's a little more complicated with, than that. I mean, it was, it's somehow the action 
Uh, in those cases, the action is compatible with the agents having the general capacities for showing their goodwill, something like that. It didn't say... Yeah, it says it's compatible with all the demands of we can place on people. Fulfilled. So what I... There, there's one way of reading that. I mean, the way I read him is he's saying, look, there's some pleas, or so, let's call them excuses, some excuses that point to the fact that the agent doesn't have the general capacities for the agency. And other excuses are compatible with the agents having the general capacities and show there's something about the, the action is problematic or the connection between those general capacities and the but. That's what I thought he was doing here, too. He was saying there are some excuses that point to the fact that the agent doesn't have the general capacities. Mm -hmm. And now these other ones, like he was pushed, blah, 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 they don't show that the agent doesn't have the general capacities. I mean, they show something else. But and, and so that's all I think he's saying here. I don't think he's making this. Ex I don't yeah, think I when you read that. He certainly does make that claim, but I have to go back and look at the text. I, I yeah, read it like last which, which time, time yesterday. So this words, one, that the saying, second group of excuses works like this. Yeah, that the, he says that the basic demand wasn't ignored, that that action was compatible with the basic demand. So he doesn't say it's yeah. compatible with goodwill, but. Yeah, but the, the basic demand, demand of showing demand. a goodwill to other people, well, I think it says something like that. The basic demand could have been met in that case. There was nothing about the agent that showed that yeah. he couldn't have met the basic demand, but that's a slightly, that just means the capacities for agency are in place. Uh, and that does not, it's not, so I know there is an interpretation of the set of excuses that has it that what he was doing is exactly the same as Frank, right? he's, he's basically saying the excuses function uh, to show that the agent didn't have ill will, but all I'm yeah, saying is it's not clear, that. it's not obvious, it's not as simple as... Yeah, I don't think he says anywhere that the excuses show that the agent didn't have an ill will, yeah. but only that it is uh, possible that yeah. he ha didn't yeah. have an ill and, will. It could be read as, look, when someone's pushed, that doesn't indicate that he doesn't have the capacity to show ill will. He, doesn't, he still has the general capacity. That's a slightly different point than the Frankfurtian, when Frankfurt meets Strassen interpretation, which I think um, is not obviously. I mean, I think the text admits of, the way to think of my view is the text admits of different interpretations, and on one interpretation, you get the problems I point to. On the other interpretation, manipulation becomes the main problem. But I just disagree that it's just obvious that he had that interpretation in mind. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I have to go back and look at Okay, this. okay, okay. Oh, there's, uh, we have a little time. Did you have something? Oh, I thought I saw your hand up. Yeah. yeah. A couple questions. Well, I mean, yeah, I think you're right about the beliefs um, playing the role. Uh, I'm not sure how different that is from, I mean, I think, I think you don't, uh, uh, some compatibilist approaches don't emphasize that, and it's probably good to emphasize it, because it does seem, it does seem right. But at the beginning, I was wondering about this error theory. How are we using the, are we, is it, not error theory in Mackey's sense, I gather, which I took to be all these claims about morality are in error. Right, and that's why he calls it an error theory. But you, you, the two of you using error theory. Yeah, Johnson said he has an error theory about people using, people invoking PIP. So mm -hmm. it's like very localized, right? And I, I thought that uh, if people invoking PIP, if it's if it's implicit, implicitly assumed by all parties that the agent had correct beliefs regarding his, his lack or his having of alternatives, mm -hmm. then I'd say that they are correct when they use it. Uh, and so you don't need to assume that there's some kind of error here that can be brought out by reflecting on Frankfurt cases. That's okay. the yeah, point. Yeah, and it may not see what I was falling into is this general view that I think many people in philosophy have, is that is if you, are going to reject a principle that many people find deeply plausible, it's somehow incumbent on you to provide an error theory, to provide an account of why so many people thought that was plausible. And so that's what I try and do. I try and say, well, they thought it was problem plausible because they didn't distinguish the two kinds of freedom. Or if they did distinguish them, they assumed that they're necessarily mm -hmm. coinstantiated. But 
in certain special cases with this signature structure of preemptive overdetermination, which we call the Frankfurt cases, uh, they, you can prize apart you know, these two kinds of controls. So that, that was my error theory, although I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure you have a strict obligation to provide an error theory. It, it's nice. I mean, if, whenever you're going to reject something, you know, so that everyone accepts, then maybe you have to explain why they fail to see it. Um, uh, like, I don't know, like, I don't know if this is a good example, when, but when Judy Thompson says, um, you know, provides uh, her violinist case, she's trying to show that even if a fetus has a right to life, it doesn't follow that abortion is always impermissible. So I guess she's providing, uh, now why did everybody think that though? Many people think that if the fetus has a right to life, then it follows that abortion is right. Her error theory is, well, everyone was focusing on only the rights of the developing individual uh, fetus and forgetting about the rights of the mother, the right to control what her should happen. Her, her error, error theory is that people thought that abortion in that case would be analogous to murder rather, yeah, than, she, rather than analogous so, to refusing to donate of your body's resources. Right, yeah, she offers various uh, ideas that could be thought of as an error theory. I don't know, that was, but I, I think strictly speaking maybe you wouldn't have to. And I, I, you know, upon reflection, I don't know how plausible my error theory is. I mean, do people really fail to make that distinction or just assume they go together? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, okay, so maybe I'm okay. done. Okay. Yeah, you are done. Thank you.